solutions for cybersecurity for the smart grid. So um, again, Jeff, Colin, uh, Galen, Chris, thank you so much for, for being here today and uh, help educate us on, uh, on this important topic. Uh, first, a few words about myself and, and what I do. I'm in the computer science laboratory at, at SRI International, which is an independent nonprofit research organization. And my group does research in security for critical infrastructures. Uh, and we also do uh, R&D portfolio management for, for our clients, uh, in particular for uh, Department of Homeland Security and their Science and Technology Directorate. So at SRI, we say that <coughs> we work on important problems, not just interesting ones. That's something we take pride in to address what's, what's really important. And we believe that cybersecurity for critical infrastructures is one of those really important problems. Um, and this has a lot to do with uh, the possible consequences of a cyber attack on, on an infrastructure. There are lots of interdependencies between our infrastructures, between uh, oil and gas, uh, telecoms, electricity and so forth. But everything in our modern society is dependent on the electric grid. So therefore, dependability, resilience of the electric grid is something that's, that's very important. And this is <clears throat> because the consequences of, of an attack could indeed be catastrophic. So when we, when we make the the new infrastructure, when we put the smart grid in place, put smart devices, computing devices, data communication in place everywhere, we have to make sure that smart doesn't mean vulnerable or hackable. Um, and unfortunately, that can be challenging because security is really not an easy topic. If cybersecurity was easy, you know, we wouldn't have to be, be discussing it, we wouldn't have to be working on it, you wouldn't have to read about it in the <coughs> newspapers every day about cybersecurity problems. For many reasons, uh, many of which we'll, we'll hear about from our panelists today, security is a difficult problem. And also, uh, it's not necessarily a topic of interest to many people. Uh, I'm very happy that, that you are here today, but it's a fairly sparse audience today, and <coughs> it's always interesting to come to these uh, energy conferences, for example. Everyone's excited about new technology and what we can do with it, and then we security people come and say, oh, wait a minute, not so fast. <coughs> but our, <coughs> what I want us to, uh, to hear about today is how we can actually use uh, technology to also make security better and make sure that we become less vulnerable, not more vulnerable. So, end of my introduction here, and uh, I'll ask each panelist to uh, to come up here, give five minutes of, of an introduction. So we'll start with, with Jeff. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks very much. I better start my clock or I'll go 25 minutes. Okay, so I'm Jeff Gooding with Southern California Edison. Uh, Southern California Edison is a utility just to the south of here. We cover 50,000 50, square miles and serve about 14 million customers. Uh, I am the uh, manager of Smart Grid Systems Engineering, so I come at cybersecurity engineering from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, prior to uh, doing that, uh, I was the chief architect of our smart meter implementation, 5 million smart meters. So if you have any tough smart meter questions, feel free uh, to shoot them at me. Um, not literally, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're, we're in Northern California. Um, anyway, so, so from my perspective, you know, we are aggressively pursuing sustainable energy goals. And what that means is we're introducing a whole range of new technologies, energy technologies to the electric grid that don't have the typical characteristics of generators that we've had in the past. So, for example, right now the grid remains stable, largely through the laws of physics. Large synchronous rotating mass propagates a robust waveform that goes all the way through to the end customer. And that allows the grid to ride through transient events, lightning strikes, all sorts of things that might happen out there uh, to wires on the grid, all sorts of faults you might see, um, you know, most of the time. And that's what makes it highly reliable. What we're seeing with the introduction of wind, solar, power electronics, uh, even some of the uh, distributed generation is you're seeing inertia which is generated by that large rotating synchronous mass, dissipate across the system. And the effect of that is you see frequency stability, which is really uh, the, the job of the California ISO and the WEC to kind of manage frequency, and voltage, 
uh, become more fragile. Voltage is the job, managing voltage is the job of the distribution company, which is, which is my company. So what that means is the time scales that we have operationally to actually respond to these emerging events so that they don't cascade into larger problems across the system are becoming much, much smaller. So the way that we actually address that problem is with technology, right? Wright Brothers plane, governed by the laws of physics, had a very specific mission. B-2 bomber, massive amounts of capability, inherently unstable in flight, and technology is used to keep it moving straight and deliver all those extra capabilities. So that analogy doesn't stand up 100% um, you know, with the electric grid, but it's a good way to think about how we're going to use technology to keep the grid stable in the future. So when am I going to get to cybersecurity in my long-winded five-minute talk? Well, <clears throat> basically now. So, so the introduction of all of this automation, all of this connected equipment, uh, does facilitate vulnerabilities. Um, and those vulnerabilities uh, actually expose us to threats uh, that need to be mitigated by security requirements and fed back into the design, hence the system engineering approach. So what we're doing about that at Southern California Edison, you know, similar to what we did on AMI, when, when we came into AMI and we said, okay, we're going to put a Zigbee radio in this, we're going to put a disconnect switch in it, and we're going to put a communications uh, network that goes all the way back to the utility. How do we make sure that the network cannot be attacked from a single and seized from a single endpoint? And so we looked across other industries and, and we started talking to the Department of Defense and specifically the NSA uh, about using some of their Sweet B technology and that derivative, a derivative of that, you know, uh, was used on AMI. Coming out of AMI, though, we realized there were some weak, weaknesses there. Very vendor-specific solution. We worked across a bunch of standards bodies to try and get everybody lined up on requirements, but there was no interoperability between solutions because of the cybersecurity. This cannot happen in a smart grid because all of these multi-vendor uh, devices have to be able to talk to each other and communicate, and the relays have to be able to very quickly uh, um, send communications back and forth on the state of the system. So we started working again <clears throat> more with, a, uh, with the federal government to transfer technology, and this is a HAPES derivative if you're familiar with the uh, cybersecurity standards in the uh, defense and intelligence industry, but this is a HAPES derivative technology. And we redid our architecture in the Grid Control Center to make a common service. So a common cybersecurity service where any device at the end could access cybersecurity services in the grid control center and we had a way to distribute that logic so if we lost communications there would still be a set of policies and a, and a set of keys out there so that's the work we've been doing now I'm looking down and it says zero um, <coughs> so I'll wind it up here um, anyway that's the work we're doing at Edison it's in uh, it's in uh, de uh, Department of Energy uh, smart grid demonstration right now running on uh, a lot of radios and we hope to be rolling this security out uh, in response to NERCSIP version 5 requirements in the utility industry uh, over the next uh, maybe year and a half. So thanks. Jeff, follow me. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Colin Lennon, and I work for uh, Honeywell Building Solutions. And uh, I'm the global offering leader for our service and energy lines of business. Uh, at Honeywell, I can tell you that we're obsessed with cybersecurity. And it has become an obsession because we do believe at uh, all levels of our organization how big this threat is. I don't know if anybody has seen the recent report that came out from the Department of Homeland Security, but uh, the first six months of this year, it's been 111 attacks on industrial control systems on the uh, electric uh, power grid. It's actually, it wasn't uh, the, the electric part as much as the natural gas distribution network that some of these hackers were really going after. That's 111 in the first half of this year and it was only 88 in all of 2012. So there is a significant increase. And so our obsession with cybersecurity is related to this, uh, not only the, the traditional threats of hackers doing it for fun, doing it for fame, doing it for fortune, 
But now it's some of the emerging threats. Cyber, uh, cyber security has become uh, uh, something that we have to worry about in terms of cyber terrorism, something we have to worry about in terms of cyber warfare. And so you can think about how important it is to build security right into everything that we do in Honeywell. Because what we do is we build out the control systems for buildings like this, but also industrial controls that go into refineries and petrochemicals and, and power distribution networks and things like that. We have demand response automation solutions that we sell to the utilities to help them manage their demand response programs. So you can think about the potential impact that uh, a hacker could have if they took over one of our systems. So that's where the obsession comes from. And we've gotten industry recognition. We are on the top 10 of the uh, Security 500 benchmark. And our chairman and CEO has uh, been at multiple executive summits at the White House uh, on, on cybersecurity and is very much helping the federal government with setting policy and making sure that we're thinking through what needs to be done to protect our critical assets. And so throughout our entire organization, it, it is everybody's job. It's not just the job of our security folks, not just the job of our product engineers, not just the job of the people that go out and make sure that we're patching and updating our systems all the time. It's everybody's job in Honeywell. And what we want to do is we want to make it more of a, an ecosystem responsibility. Jeff just mentioned it very well, is, is you got this smart grid where you have all of these different technology players that are inventing technology and they all have to communicate with one another. So it's important for us as an ecosystem to make sure that we're addressing the cybersecurity problem and working together because the hackers are working together. The hackers are, are investing billions upon billions of dollars to get into these networks and, re and wreak havoc. And so we have to make sure that we're working together and being, bringing the best and the brightest together sharing our knowledge and our best practices so that we can get always a step ahead of our quote-unquote competition, which is a very nasty group of people. So with that, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Galen Rasha. I'm a technical executive with the Electric Power Research Institute. And I manage our cybersecurity program for our power delivery systems there. And uh, so if you're not familiar with EPRI, we're a nonprofit uh, independent research institute based here in Palo Alto. Um, we're actually the uh, collaborative applied research institute for the electric sector. And our research programs are funded by utilities from around the world. And cybersecurity is a very, very important issue to them. So why is that? Well. They view cybersecurity as being critical for protecting their current systems, but also as an enabler for deploying the next generation grid technologies. Because I mean, the fact is, if you don't implement good cybersecurity, you really can't or at least shouldn't deploy a smarter grid. Um, so I'm going to ask a quick question here. Who here works in cybersecurity? So one person quickly dropped his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, hopefully you'll leave today with, with uh, better understanding of some of the basics of cybersecurity and how they apply to the smart grid. And it's a very, very challenging area. If it was easy, it would have been solved already. But there's a lot of um, differences between IT systems and operational systems that make cybersecurity more challenging. And you also have issues of um, legacy systems and other equipment that's in the field that doesn't support cybersecurity very easily that can make it, make it very challenging. But I think the main thing to keep in mind today, though, is that um, even though cybersecurity can be challenging at times, it is still a key component of grid resiliency. So just keep that in mind. Um, like I said, it can seem like a, a showstopper sometimes if you try to bolt it in at the end. But if you plan it correctly, it can really uh, needs to be that key component to help maintain um, a resilient grid. There. So we've heard about some, uh, some of the cool technology that um, SCE is deploying with their CCS architecture. It's a very advanced security architecture and somewhat Honeywell is doing. Um, I decided I'd talk a little bit about a challenge area that's not quite as exciting but and gets left off the discussion sometimes, and that's assessing and monitoring risk. So the fact is, right now there is not a common, commonly used, industry accepted set of methods for assessing and monitoring risk in the, in the electric sector. Now, there's been some good work that's been done uh, recently on 
um, creating more common ways to do security assessments for utilities. So for example, um, in 2012, the White, there was a White House initiative um, that where they worked very closely with DOE and DHS to develop the electricity subsector uh, cybersecurity capabilities maturity model, which it's a bit of a mouthful, but it goes by the acronym uh, ESC2M2. And what that did is it uh, provided utilities with a common set of guidelines to measure how mature their cybersecurity processes are in key domains, such as you know, configuration management, asset management, identity and access management, threat and vulnerability management, situational awareness, all great areas. And so you could take that and see how mature your, your utility was in these different areas and compare that from one utility to another. But what it doesn't do necessarily is actually tell you how to assess your risk and monitor your security posture in real time. So I think that's a very big gap right now for the industry and one that we need to be working on as a research community and applied research community um, as well as working with, uh, with utilities in that process. Um, but one, one issue there that holds that back is also not having a common set of uh, security metrics to be able to measure that what your security posture is. Now, uh, uh, utilities have, in general, taken different processes from the IT space and adapted it you know, to their particular um, situation. But once again, there's not this common way of measuring what that security posture is across the electric sector. So, but if you had that ability, then it'd be possible for you know, the executives of utility to know where do they stand right now, and it'd be possible to have a much better idea for an electric sector as a whole, where do we stand as a critical infrastructure on our security posture? And right now, that's a very difficult thing to measure. So if you don't know where you stand, you, know, you can also still create and deploy great um, architectures and good um, incident monitoring technology but it's hard to know exactly how secure you are without that. So. Thank you, Dale. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Villarreal with the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, thank you all for coming and inviting me to be on this panel. Um, so before I begin, here's my usual disclaimer. Um, I, since I do work for a state agency, any opinions that I may express are my own and not those of the commission of which I represent. So on cybersecurity, um, the commission really got um, really involved, or commission staff at least, got um, more involved in cybersecurity beginning last September when the staff of the PUC issued a white paper outlining steps that a state commission, in particular the California State Commission, may choose to do in ensuring the security of the grid going forward. And it outlined several reasons for doing that, as well as several challenges on how to make that happen. So I'm just going to talk about the challenges side of it. So the first thing to remember is that the PUC only regulates the distribution aspect of the electric utilities business. So all the wires you see driving down on the, on the streets, those are the ones that we regulate. The big ones you see on the highway, we don't regulate. That's regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So right off the bat, we have a jurisdictional issue. On the transmission side, there are long-standing cybersecurity standards uh, promulgated by NERC. There has not been anything on the distribution side done by any state regulatory body ever. So this is one of the big challenges, is as things start to show up on the distribution grid that are smarter, that interconnect with other things, the challenge from the state perspective is, how do we make sure that those new things that the utility wants to put in are secure? What steps does, should a commission do to make sure that the utility is considering cybersecurity on these new investments? One of the ways that we do that is, as Jeff was talking about all of his fun little projects he wants to do, is that we have to approve the budgets for those fun projects that Jeff wants to do. So if Jeff wants to do a fun little project and it gets rolled into the rate case and we review it and we say that looks good, but it's too much money at this time of the day, to this time of year. So that money you want, we're gonna cut it in half. Use that money and go do your job. So as we start thinking about how do we understand what the fun project that Jeff wants to do, we have to start having an understanding of what is the impact of that. How do we know that the programs that Jeff wants to do, the risks that he wants to take, and the way he wants to measure is how do we know that the money that the PUC has to fund for those programs is worth it? How do we measure the success of those things? And Galen's talking about metrics. And that's one of the things that we are still struggling with here at the state level 
is how do we make sure the money that's being spent is appropriate? How do we know it's not gold-plated? How do we know it's not enough? How do we know we're just lucky? Um, and so that's one of the challenges, that, at least on the state side, we still have going forward. Um, another one is, of course, staff expertise. Um, the PUC is headquartered in San Francisco, and we basically get paid Sacramento money. So it becomes very difficult to retain or even hire the requisite experts that are needed to go into, Jeff, go into Edison, review their audits, make sure that, that their cybersecurity program is appropriate. We don't have that technical staff that can do that. Um, for example, the three people sitting up here as well as Ulf, if you read their bios, they have very long his, uh, education backgrounds and long history of, of work. If you read mine, I have a BA in history. So here I am, a history major, talking about cybersecurity. That's just an example of sort of the challenges that many states have. Um, as going forward, so we have our white paper that talks about the electric grid. And, we're, and for the most part, we're talking about electric grid. But the PUC regulates more industries than just the electric grid. We regulate the natural gas companies, investor-owned natural gas companies. We regulate the landline telecommunication carriers. And finally, we regulate the water companies. So as we start thinking about this C2M2 or the risk management pro uh, protocol that was also developed by DOE, and we are focusing on electric, let's not forget the inter interdependencies amongst the utilities, or amongst the industries. So without electricity, does water get pumped? And without water, can many power plants run effectively? So how does cybersecurity policies that are developed, for example, at the state level, how does that impact and how, that can, how can that be implemented across other industries that are seeing similar risks? Water company has SCADA networks just as the electric utility does. Water company may be about 20 years behind on the technology investment, but that's just at, that's the perfect time to do it. You know, we're, talk, we're talking about building security into the investments. This is the exact time we want to do that as we do smart grid, as utilities eventually, as the water utilities especially, eventually start catching up on the technology, making sure the security is built in provides a more cost-effective solution for the rate payers, for the customers, and for the utilities that the commission regulates. Um, the last thing I, I just want to bring up is California, despite having our paper and being in the press all the time, is not the only state doing cybersecurity. There are many other states that are struggling with the same issue and investigating the same questions. The state of Missouri has a rulemaking opened up last July asking these same questions. Now one of the challenges that we have is how do we have a public record for determining these policies? The Missouri PSC they issued a series of literally 70 questions to their utilities to answer, and that filing was all filed under seal, which is good for the PSC staff and utilities to work together, but not very helpful for the public or the other experts that are really necessary for developing good policies on this. So as we go forward, you know, California, the PUC is doing a lot on cybersecurity, and we're getting a lot of good press, but there are other states doing just as much work, if not slightly more than us, that as an industry, we should all be aware that what happens to Southern California as an or pg &E is very likely to happen to other utilities. And the ability of sharing that information across utilities with one or another and across PUCs is going to be a very valuable tool going forward and one that we should be working together to support. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Linda. So now we're going to go over to the, to the discussion uh, portion of the, of the panel. Uh, and I'm going to start by asking our, our panelists some questions, and we'll uh, we'll have uh, the one who, who feels most compelled answer the respective questions, and, uh, and we'll get a discussion going. Um, so we heard in your introduction, uh, your respective introductions, that the cybersecurity for this smart grid is facing many challenges. So I want to start by asking, what are the most important things that your respective organizations and your partners are, are doing to make sure that the smart grid is as secure as it, as it needs to be, uh, both looking at, at today's problem and also looking ahead into the future. So uh, who wants to take on that? Jeff Simsinger. Yeah, I, I guess I can start. I, I think, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times utility companies approach problems like cybersecurity by looking at the minimum set of requirements they need to meet in order to just comply with a policy or a regulation. It's not just the utilities. Yeah, and so <laughs> <laughs> it's like an epidemic across yeah. our industry. <laughs> anyway, um, so you know, I think when we start looking at how to solve these problems and how to bake a solution into 
a, a, how to bake a cybersecurity solution into a new capability or a new solution we're developing, we're really not just looking at meeting the minimum set of requirements anymore. I think the most important thing we're doing is trying to look ahead and figuring out how to design systems and develop architectures that are flexible enough to accommodate new requirements in the future that we don't really know. And that means, from a practical standpoint, what that means is a lot of the solutions we're developing are more like platforms that host policies. They're policy-based types of solutions uh, that allow us to respond to the changing threat environment. So aside from the investment and aside from all the money that Chris is going to send us, um, I think, you know, really taking that focus, that strong system engineering look ahead and making the most of every dollar that comes our way so that we don't have to rip things out and replace them in the future uh, is really critical mm -hmm. in, uh, in meeting these challenges. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's key, Jeff. And one of the things that we always struggle with is our product engineers always thought about security as an afterthought. So all of a sudden we'd be, you know, well down the product development path and somebody would say, you know what, uh, we haven't taken a look at the security of this thing yet. Let's have a, let's have a look at what's under the covers. And then they'd get angry when we'd find 5,000 vulnerabilities on it. <laughs> and back to the drawing board. And it was the security guy's fault for finding all the vulnerabilities, right? So, mm -hmm. so over the years, we've had to really teach our guys that security isn't an afterthought. Security is an upfront investment and that architecture is so critical. And so it's, it's kind of like building a house or building a commercial building. I mean, that foundation is necessary and absolutely critical from our perspective of, mm -hmm. about getting off to a good start and not making security an afterthought. Mm -hmm. So with that solid foundation, then you can build products and services that are going to be secure in their nature because you started off on the right foot. Uh, and then after the fact, one of the important things is just making sure that you've got process and governance in place so that you can check back and make sure that that security architecture has been implemented correctly. Because all it takes is one engineer to go down the wrong path and to take their own version of the architecture that you've set forth, and you can open yourselves up to a lot of vulnerability. So it's really important that everybody is engaged, everybody understands what that architecture is and how it needs to be implemented, and then having the process and the procedures and the governance in place to check that everybody's doing their work appropriately. It's a very good point, and, and since most of you in the audience perhaps do not work in cybersecurity, but maybe you de develop new technologies, you oversee them, you, you, you fund them, you support them, uh, you promote them, it's a very important point to make sure security is there from the beginning, because we've so, seen so many times where something is readily developed, and now let's look for security problems, and guess what? We usually find a lot yeah, of them. Mm -hmm. All right, and I'll add on to the end, or the second part of the security cycle then. So, so we're talking about how you can build security in and protect, uh, protect devices, but another key area that we've been working in is how to manage incidents. And so that's how you detect, respond, and recover from cyber incidents. Because I think even with really good security protections in place, there are going to be um, cybersecurity incidents. There are going to be security breaches. And that's mainly because um, it would be very, very expensive to implement all the security controls necessary to make every single system be impervious to any type of cyber incident. It's just not cost effective um, to do that. Uh, so we've been um, working with our uh, utility members on this um, since uh, 2012. And this year we've been focusing more on transmission distribution system and enterprise security as well. And uh, right now um, we've been focusing on how to help them develop an integrated security operations center. And I don't, probably nobody here has been inside of a security operations center, um, but think of how to describe one. If, you may have seen a scene in a, on a TV show or in a movie where people go into this room with have maybe 20 monitors on the wall. There's usually a picture of a world map on there somewhere, and all these operators with four, four screens in front of them with all these alarms and logs and things you know, going by and things flash red on there, you know, and they're supposed to go do something about it then. So that's kind of a gives you a visual image of what a secure operations center is or how it, how it functions. Now, we're not advocating something as um, grand as a global, global secure operations center for everybody, but, um, but right now, um, one of the challenges is that um, it can be very difficult to correlate incidents um, within a single utility that occur on corporate systems and also on their OT systems. So what's happening in their control centers, on their transmission, 
systems, their distribution systems, their AMI systems, their physical security systems. Right now, um, these are usually uh, handled by different power systems groups, and so they can be siloed there. And so if there is an incident, it can be difficult or take some time to go track down the information you might need from each of those domains. And so some of our um, members have on their technology roadmaps now to build out an integrated security operations center. And so then if you have that, you can have this a much, much better um, situational awareness for what's actually going on within the entire utility. And it's not just connecting these systems. If you think about how um, physically spread apart also, you know, the power systems are, I mean, you know, you're really looking at, at systems over a very large geographic area. So there. To, yeah. So again, so, let me yeah. let me stop you there and mm -hmm. uh, uh, move to to a related topic of, mm -hmm. and that uh, Chris also mentioned about jurisdiction and the many uh, stakeholders. So uh, in security for the smart grid, we're talking about the federal government, the state governments, mm -hmm. the utilities, uh, the industry uh, groups, the system vendors like Honeywell here, uh, research labs like EPRI and SRI, and, and many other stakeholders. So. I'd like to hear somehow we, we look at the respective roles of these stakeholders and also if you can describe how you're collaborating with, with uh, some of these other parties uh, today and also if you have ideas for how we can get better at collaboration, information sharing and so forth. Sure, I'll, I'll start. So the usual mission statement of a regulatory body is, is we oversee the utilities to, to make sure they provide safe and reliable service at a reasonable cost. One of the things the white paper proposed is adding the word secure. So we regulate the utilities to make sure that the power supply is safe, reliable, and secure at a reasonable cost for indeed if it's not secure, your power can neither be safe nor reliable. Um, so that's one of the cultural challenges or issues that, that the commission is being to, is that we're beginning to address. So what do we do is that we have we, we do work with the utilities. I come to conferences like these, I get on phone calls with a number of national standards development efforts that people talk over my head and I just focus on the policy side and how it implicates the utilities we regulate. Um, that, that runs the gamut from all sorts of things. And uh, the funny thing is, you know, we're talking about how we're at, at a um, technical conference like today with all fun, all sorts of tech vendors out there and we talk about security the guys in the room that always be, that no one wants to talk about. We also do privacy and if we think security is in the wet blanket, you should try privacy talking to the big data people. <laughs> um, the other thing is, you know, Jeff was talking about flexibility and rates, I hate talking about rates, so I'll, be this, I'll do this very quickly. Utilities come and ask for funding every three to four years. So we have to budget for the utilities on a three to four year rate cycle. I don't believe people hack utility networks on a three to four year rate cycle. So how do we let the utilities and work together with utilities to make sure that, that they have the appropriate flexibility to respond to these threats accordingly as they evolve over time? Because we can't wait three to four years for them to come back and say, oh, we had something that happened three years ago. We need money to do something to respond to that. That is way too late. And the pace of technological change is going to be one of these challenges I think we're all going to have to address at some point. So, Chris, you mentioned time scales, and, and Jeff, you, you talked about that too. And we, we see this challenge where IT technology evolves so fast, but we're, we're looking at infrastructures where technology investment has to last for a very long time. And even things like uh, the AMI, the smart meters, uh, if they cost $100 each and you put them out to 10 million customers, that's a it's a fair investment that you're probably not going to do every two, three years when you need to upgrade them. So this is a, a keeping up with all the big changes in technology and vulnerabilities in attacks in security technology and so forth. That's a real challenge for, for these kinds of, of industries where you can't just throw out the server and put in a new one. So would any of you like to comment on that? Yeah, so I, I think, <clears throat> you know, good AMI lesson learned for me was you do want to try and keep the utility technology that's deployed and selected um, a fair distance away from fast cycle technology, meaning fast cycle technology <coughs> is dominated by consumer adoption uh, of new technology. And when you look at where those two things interface, you want to make sure that you don't, as, as a, as a uh, utility company, pick a Take, take a really hard stand on a technology. And I think that was a good lesson learned from uh, selecting Zigbee and putting them in the meters. Now the world is going to be dominated by Wi-Fi, 
Zigbee is not going to be the home automation standard. Um, we have five million Zigbee radios out deployed. So what are we going to do? We're going to put gateways out, and it's going to be more expensive than Chris and I had originally thought about to actually get this market off the ground. And you need to understand that when it comes to fast cycle technology and consumer adopted technology, you know the utility companies really are are unable to participate in influencing those markets uh, on the other side of the meter. So what that means is we need to get comfortable using any communications pathway. We need to develop company, competencies that allow us to connect to the customer and their devices uh, in a way, uh, in whatever way um, is available. So if that's through the GM OnStar uh, communications, if that's through the internet to get to an inverter, uh, to get services that, that allow us um, to, you know, send price signals down so that, or some sort of signal down so that an inverter can behave to contribute to the overall health of the system, or at least not do harm to the low voltage uh, uh, transformers, then that's, you know, sort of the approach that we we have come to settle on. I don't know if that exactly mm -hmm. answers that question, but no, it does. it's it a hard problem. Good. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to comment on that? The only thing, the only thing I'd add to that too is um, the the challenge is all over the place, right? It's in controls, it's in you know critical infrastructure, it's in servers, it's in networks, it's in everything, and the pace of change for technology, the pace of change in the security community in terms of their capability and the amount of money that goes into their capability mm -hmm. is astronomical. So. It goes back to, again, what, what I talked about earlier in that the ecosystem has to work together and combine forces more and more to stay a step ahead. Mm -hmm. What that means is standard bodies are going to take more of a, a, a critical role in making sure that we're staying a step ahead. Uh, companies like Honeywell are going to have to work with some of our technology partners and our customers to make sure that we're implementing technology that isn't going to require a significant upgrade so that you can get more security benefit from it, that we're making these systems and this infrastructure that's patchable and updatable so that we can stay ahead. Right. So it's it, it goes back to all of us need to be working together, all of us need to be putting the best and brightest right. on solving the problem because the problem gets worse every day. It doesn't get easier. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm, I'm sounding very doomy and gloomy today. Yeah, it's been that wow. kind of a travel okay, week. I guess so let's I'm see if we can switch to something positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing about security, though, is that it's, it's not all about technology. And uh, people-related issues play a big role. And sometimes they play a bigger role than technology issues. Uh, we're all kind of technologists, but uh, would you like to comment on the, on the people-related aspects of security? Uh, perhaps on the consumer facing things or what you do for, for awareness inside and outside your organizations? Right. Well, I think Jeff could probably talk to this um, very directly as a utility, but you know, one of the trends that's been happening um, across the electric sector is um, a couple of staffing problems. You know, one is that I think in the next five years, there's some very large percentage of, of electric utility staff that are expected to retire. You know, so we're actually losing a lot of the um, capabilities just on the power system there. Um, but then also, there are not very many people that have a very good, solid understanding of how the power systems work, how communication systems work, how networks work, how cybersecurity works. You know, the, there's not a lot of people that, ha that walk around with good capabilities in each of those areas. And so I know that um, DOE has been investing a lot um, in various programs to focus on workforce development um, for the electric sector there. And um, I think one effort um, that's out there is um, sponsored by the National Board of Information Security Examiners. And they were looking at uh, what are the security capabilities that you want operators to have and different roles within a, or an organization to have, and how can we um, test for those capabilities. You might have something like the CISSP, which you know, focuses more on IT systems, what is the equivalent of that you know, for an operator for the electric sector? And so that's been an ongoing effort, um, but it's not, not complete yet. So what I'll, I'll say is that we have, there, there are three, the three points I want to make on this one. One is um, you know, the, the people challenges. You know, as we've heard all day today in California, there are many of the policies on the energy side is pushing more and more things on the distribution grid. 
onto things beyond side customers' homes. So as we think about the people's issue, the utility is going to have less and less control over this. So how are the people setting up their distribution grid or their uh, DG units, their storage units, things that are on the side of their house or inside their home that the utility has not control over? So the utilities have to handle that. Uh, two is an issue, as again, we're talking about people, we have supply chain questions still. You know, the utilities in Honeywell and they have to re are relying on vendors to provide them with things. And how sure are we that those things that they're buying are secure? How secure is the supply chain of those vendors? Um, so how we determine that level of comfort is going to be a challenge. And the third thing, um, the commission had a thought leaders earlier this year, and what was repeated over and over in this conference is that the number one cybersecurity threat is still phishing. Mm -hmm. Getting an email and someone clicking on something they're not supposed to be clicking on. So the phishing and then allowing the malware to, to worm their way into the utility networks just through email is still I mean, what we're told is the number is still the most likely successful means to hack into a utility network. Yeah, it's amazing what people will click on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, w one more thing to add to that about security awareness. Uh, in Honeywell, we've implemented a security awareness program that's very comprehensive, and every employee is educated on a very consistent basis about not only things that impact Honeywell, but things that impact their personal lives. Like, how do you protect yourself from phishing attempts? How do you protect your, your identity? And, and how do you safeguard your, your family and your children from security issues? And so that combination of uh, training related to security in the job or in the workplace with making it personal and providing them some value in their home and in their everyday lives has really gotten people's attention, I think, and focus and awareness on every day that security is something we need to be thinking about. So that's one of the things that I would recommend in all your organizations is to think about how you make it personal. Not an email that you ignore, but an email with a newsletter or an email with a link to a webcast that people really think about going to because there's some value in their personal lives. Right, very good. So I hope everyone here knows what, what phishing is about. <coughs> it's when you, when you get that email that says you won the lottery or it's from your bank or your airline, click here, just enter your social security number and everything and, and your, uh, <coughs> your uh, debit card pin and you'll be fine. That's, <laughs> don't click on those. All right, so we, we're going to open up uh, questions from the audience just before we do that. Uh, is there any uh, sort of key takeaway messages from the, the panel for the audience today that you want to make sure that we state before we go into the open question session? I mean, I guess I can give a, a quick one just on the last question. It, it takes me, so when I hire an IT cybersecurity uh, student, um, it usually takes two to three years to get them trained up on how the electric grid works and teach them about embedded systems. I have a much easier time hiring electrical engineers and training them up on how to uh, uh, figure out how to secure a lot of these systems. So somewhere along the line, cybersecurity got off into its own silo. Mm. And, and from an education standpoint, it would be great to see people that had multidisciplinary capabilities in systems engineering um, you know, added into the cybersecurity mix, because it, it does take a long time and a lot of investment on our part right. to bring those folks up to speed. Good point. And I think it's an excellent point. Um, I, I would say the same is, is to make that, don't make security its own thing. Don't make it something separate. Make sure that security is everyone's uh, challenge and everyone's opportunity to keep our systems and our, and our network safe. And uh, uh, to make sure that not only within your organization but outside your organization that you're working with your ecosystem partners to make sure we're sharing those best practices, making sure that we're developing standards that are going to help our overall industry and keep us safe. All right. Um, I would just add um, that you know, it sounds like there are a lot of challenges still in cybersecurity, and there are. I want to emphasize, though, that there's been a lot of work that's been going on in this area since, I'd say, around 2007, 2008. Or so, you know. So there's a lot of good reference material out there and methodologies out there. Like the, uh, you could find the NISTR 7628, which is cybersecurity guidelines for the smart grid. You know, so if you find yourself in a position of needing to look at cybersecurity for the smart grid, don't start from scratch. There's a lot of good material out there. Make sure to make sure to use it. So the the one thing I, I would make sure you all are aware of is that the the relationship between the PUCs and in this instance the electric utilities are actually really good on this topic. Uh, it's not inconceivable for me to say that two, even two years ago, 
Jeff's regulatory affairs people wouldn't say, no way will you be on a cybersecurity panel with a regulatory representative. <laughs> so the fact that we, are, that we are able to, and routinely now, be on panels together talking about cybersecurity, I think, is a good showing that, we, that the utilities and the regulatory bodies are aware that this is a solution that we are both having to work together to, to implement and to address. Excellent. Great. Makes us all feel better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. So uh, if you have any questions, please walk up to the microphone here so everyone one can hear you. Uh, it, it would help. <laughs> Some security conferences, people are anonymous. But <laughs> uh, my name's Paul Grant. Um, uh, since 2006, I've been an independent energy technology consultant here in the Valley. Uh, prior to that, though, I had a 40-year, that's 4-0, career with IBM. And that was followed by a 12-year career at EPRI as a science fellow. Um, Actually, well, listening to this, I remember in the 1950s, as a 21-year-old programmer for IBM, working on the NORAD system, that we actually uh, did some encryption of the teletype communications between, this is way before the internet, by the way, uh, uh, between the radar stations and the central computers. Now, this isn't a cybersecurity question I'm going to ask now. Uh, it's physical security. And after 2000, after 9-11 at EPRI, we put together an informal red team. And our red team launched an attack on the transmission substations in California, 10 of the largest. We armed ourselves with hunting rifles, and we knew where to shoot at the 300 MEV uh, transformers. And we calculated we could bring down the state of California for months. So my question is, what's the condition of the physical security of the infrastructure in California and the United States? Given the fact, just a few minutes, ago, just a few months ago, some amateurs were able to compromise Metcalf. Does everybody know what Metcalf is? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, not in the audience. Well, they know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, we'll, we'll leave, uh, so right. to the extent that you can answer this, yeah, this I mean, question, it's a, it's a 500 kV substation uh, in PG&E's territory. Uh, where somebody shot the, uh, luckily they didn't know exactly what they were doing like yes. in your simulation, um, but a lot of mineral oil was, was uh, spilled out of the transformers and they were able to get it back up and running. You know, so from 10 years ago, from that study that EPRI did that you participated in, uh, we had the large transformers sitting out in the yard, the spares. Some of them take three, five years to build. Uh, yes. And from that study, uh, we got rail cars out there and, and at least moved the spares uh, off to a more secure location so they weren't all sitting together in the yard just waiting for, you know, if one fails, then you, you take the line and you just hook up to the next one. Um, you know, I have to say, because the infrastructure is so distributed and big, um, uh, we still do not have adequate defense against somebody with a hunting rifle who actually knows where to hit uh, a transformer other than those spares. Uh, and um, we do have fiber optics now. We do have communications. We do have alarming. Um, however, as far as protecting against the attack itself physically, um, you do not see the really high walls or anything mm -hmm. like that. Now, maybe, maybe because of this situation in PG&E, uh, we're going to get ordered to uh, uh, do something more physically secure. We have in, w a lot of the security problems we've had in the past 10 years have been people stealing copper and, and sometimes not so successfully, unfortunately, for them. Um, and, and so we have a lot of thermal imaging and that sort of stuff out there, video cameras. But nothing like a security force, uh, you know, that, that's protecting the, the broadly distributed stuff. Just, just one more question. In, in the study, the red team study we did at EPRI, one of the issues was cascading failures if you took out you exactly. know, certain substations. Mm -hmm. Now, has that been treated now with better communications? Yes, actually. Um, so we, we do have the, the RAS schemes, uh, remedial action schemes that are in place at the substations. Uh, have been, there's projects underway to centralize some of them. So you do have better protection. Phaser measurement units, we have about 20 of them, uh, in, in, uh, which actually allows us to see whether we're suffering uh, from a wide area uh, problem or whether it's localized. So 
a lot better simulation and modeling is going on inside the utility company right now, so, and we're pushing that down to these automated systems. So I'm feeling a lot better about our automated protections than even five years ago. Um, but again, these areas are, are still you know, under development, some of them, and not as broadly deployed as we would like, and we continue to actually you know, move forward on that front. So all your points are well taken. But it sounds to me like these are areas where the new technology actually can lead to better security. Uh, we heard about, about the power electronics that Secretary Chu was talking about this morning. Uh, if that, they replace the big physical transformers, they would be easier to, to protect. Uh, and with the increased monitoring, you don't have to wait for a phone call from a customer to figure out how the grid is doing. You can actually see that in real time. It, it's true, but there's still very remote locations with very adverse weather conditions <clears throat> where the phys physical security, as good as you can make it, is still yeah. not good enough. We've got a customer that has a wonderful perimeter fence and some great security cameras, but when they got uh, 10 feet of snow, <laughs> you walk right over the top of the fence yeah. on top of the snow. I won't say where it is. I won't say what the customer was. <laughs> right. But let's just say you can get yourself into areas of the grid across the United States in some very adverse conditions that you're not as well protected as you'd like to be. So I'm glad to hear that Southern California Edison is in good shape. But let's just say that it, the answer to your question is it depends. All right. Next question. Hi. Um, I'm Kareem Farhad. I'm a PhD student in management science and engineering here at Stanford. Um, I guess my question is, how will cybersecurity change the business model for utilities? And if I was asking the CPUC, I would say, how should it change the business model for utilities? And I, I'm going to give two, two sub-branches for the question. One is that, are we, if, we're, if we look five or ten years from today, are we going to look into more centralized, more regulated, more controlled kind of regime, or are we going to look at more deregulated, where we have some more competition and thus some more market incentive to drive innovation into the utilities. This is on, on one side and then on the other side is that does it does cybersecurity um, or should cybersecurity be addressed by the utilities themselves or should we allow external parties to address the cybersecurity issue of the of delivering electricity so PGE can just deliver the electrons and we can count on somebody like Google to make sure that our lines are secure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Chris, that's all yours. Um, nice. I have to admit, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> There's so much wrapped in that question that it impacts not only the cybersecurity policies that, it, that we would regulate over, but just a simple market delivery of electricity. Um, so the way I would say it right now is that, this is going to be a very legal statement, unfortunately, is that Current legislation does not allow the situation that you're talking about. Right now, the utilities are the provider of electricity unless you happen to live in a CCA area, a community choice aggregation area. So the, the delivery of electricity services itself is something that is subject to state law and we would, uh, let me strike that last statement. Uh, it's, it's subject to state law and that's sort of what our restrictions are right now. Now, as we think about the business model, how cybersecurity changes the business model, I don't know, I, I, my suspicion is that as things become more distributed, I, I'll use that word, um, the utility challenges change, and the ability of the utilities then to recover appropriate rates to fund those new services they have to, or the new programs they have to then implement, becomes very challenging if there is not a sufficient rate base to support those investments. So that becomes, that becomes a, a very different issue and one that you know, I think the utilities are all facing as we heard, I believe Secretary Chu yourself said, that the, the, the shrinking rate base becomes a problem as more and more customers come off of the utility, off the, off the utility. Just a quick, quick mm -hmm. clarification on the legal issue. So rather than you know, the utility going and hiring somebody and training them for three years to become really experts in cybersecurity, is, are you saying that we cannot basically have a utility like PG&E contract with a company like Google to actually take care of the cybersecurity for mm -hmm. them? Well, so maybe I can just answer what I've seen in other industries. There's some aspects of security that can, you can outsource, for example, monitoring even the security operations center. But if you're an organization that's responsible for operating critical infrastructure, you have to have some responsibility of the security for that. That cannot be outsourced. Well, uh, part of our monopoly charter, right, as utility companies is to ensure the reliability of the grid. So while we might be able to hire 
um, you know, the best brains in the world, which we often look for in order to help us solve some of the, these problems, um, we would not abdicate our responsibility for maintaining the reliability of the grid because that is our charter as a, as a business. The Gridwise Architecture Council actually is doing a lot of um, research on something called transactive energy. So you might want to take a look at that as far as distributed energy resource uh, integration with the grid, because that, that might be uh, an, an area or a model for what the future of, uh, you know, the, the business model migrates to in, in the utility sector. So I actually have a very brief comment, but before I get to the question, you can outsource to Google because the hardware software integration is, is intimate, uh, period. But I, when I was listening to you, now I, uh, Steve Chu, Stanford professor, um, <laughs> I had a previous job where I had to know a lot about cybersecurity. I mean, we guard the nukes, we have national labs. Um, and my question to the panel is, how many of you have actually have security clearances and have gotten briefings? Anybody? Okay, so um, <laughs> let, me, let me just say that it's a lot scarier than you think. Mm -hmm. And then there are various levels of security briefings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, even the, the lowest level security briefing, will, I will you will be convinced it is a lot scarier than you think. Uh, and the higher up you go, the more scared you get. So audience, if you weren't scared enough, enough already. <laughs> uh, so, 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 um, I'm, and when we were working with Homeland Security and trying books, we have a lot of the very high tech computer stuff. Again, you know, some of our firewalls have to be, all the stuff having to do with the nuclear weapons has to be very, very good. Uh, and as we start working with them and trying to figure these things out, this has come up that, uh, because you know the financial guys have, are very concerned because you know this is billions of dollars uh, switching by in a keystroke, but the energy infrastructure should have at least equal concern, and so I'm a little you know and, and so this is something where we were trying to figure out how to get the utilities to get a security clearance type of thing that yeah. you begin at least get a glimpse of it. When Google got a glimpse of what was really happening, and Sergey Brin in particular, he just, oh my God. Mm -hmm. it's, it scared the bejesus out of Google, <laughs> so okay? Yeah, I, I so mean, this I, is serious. There's nothing, so the most frustrating meeting, to your point, the most frustrating meeting I had in the last year was when my CEO came to talk to us who were working in cybersecurity in the research department about the briefing, the classified briefing he went mm -hmm. to. He couldn't tell us anything except just vague generalities about foreign militaries attacking investor-owned utilities. And I'm like, well, we cannot, if a foreign military government with all their resources decides to attack an IOU infrastructure, we need help from our own yeah. military yeah. and intelligence So this is, this is a work in progress because right. Homeland Security uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the administration, uh, not this particular administration, any administration, really has to begin to work with the utilities because most chances the utilities won't have their wherewithal. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you. Yeah, no, we don't. Uh, uh, and yet, and, the, and there are certain things that, that you know, but, and, but then it's, once you know what's possible, it also makes it easier for people to get it's got a double-edged sword to this, but but I, I would say uh, not to make anyone in this audience nervous, but you should be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on that note, I hope you'll all sleep well after hearing this panel. Right. Let's uh, let's thank the, the panelists. <laughs>